Good afternoon and welcome to the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership webinar, Protecting Cold Water Fish Habitat in Minnesota Lakes. I'm Joe Noner. I'm the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership Coordinator and I'd like to share a little bit of information about the partnership and some logistics for the webinar before we get started today. The Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, also known as the MGLP, hosts these lake conservation webinars to share science, management, and outreach efforts of interest to our partners. You can keep up to date with our webinars by checking out the webinar page at midwestglaciallakes.org or through our newsletter. Webinars in this series will be added to our webpage along with other webinars of interest. We've got about 12, 20 webinars this year. Notifications for the webinars are also provided through the newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website. If you'd like to share your own experience or project results through a webinar like this, please reach out to me, Joe Noner, at nonerj at michigan.gov. For those of you unfamiliar with the MGLP, we're a partnership of professionals and stakeholders focused on conserving over 40,000 glacially formed inland lakes across the Nate State region. Our mission is to protect, rehabilitate, and enhance sustainable fish habitats in glacial lakes of the Midwest for the use and enjoyment of current and future generations. And so in doing that, the partnership provides science for lake conservation, such as our conservation planner, which provides information about every lake in the partnership, we provide outreach and education to stakeholders and to professionals through webinars, news releases, Twitter com conversations, and sharing materials related to lake conservation. And we provide funding for science, outreach and education, and on the ground rehabilitation um, or protection projects through our lakes conservation grant, which we just announced on Monday, the request for proposals for that grant. The grant is released every year uh, and provides about $300,000 for lake conservation projects that benefit fishes. In terms of logistics for today's webinar, today's presentation should last about 20 to 25 minutes and we'll hold the remaining time for questions uh, after that. Participants are gonna be muted during this webinar. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function to submit them. If you take your mouse and hover it over the bottom of the screen, you should see a Q&A icon. And if you click on that, you'll be able to submit a question to, um, to me and to Pete. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to answer that question at the end of the presentation. Um, the chat function is also available for attendees to use, but we prefer that your questions go through the Q&A function. If for some reason you have any technical difficulties, or if you'd like to share this webinar with somebody else that couldn't attend, we will post a video of the webinar to our website um, within about a week. So with that said, uh, today's speaker is Pete Jacobson. Pete worked with the Mich Minnesota DNR uh, he was there for 32 years and retired as a fishery scientist with numerous contributions to the literature um, and management thinking. Pete is now semi-retired and works with the Hubbard Soil, Water, and Conservation District um, in Minnesota. Um, and so with that, Pete, I will hand over the controls to you, and I very much look forward to your presentation on protecting cold water fish habitat in Minnesota lakes. Great, thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I, I worked uh, for many years for Minnesota DNR and, and uh, really got into some, I think, pretty cool things in the habitat side towards the end of my career. And this is part of that. Some of the work we did when they are still ongoing, and a lot of it is gone is ongoing through the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership. So thanks for your interest. Um, these are some pretty cool fish, but more importantly than that, it's kind of more about the lakes they live on. Then. Cold water fish, native cold water fish in lakes live in some really nice lakes. So I want to describe some of the conservation strategies that we developed, um, both from a water quality and from a climate change adaptation point of view uh, in Minnesota, and then talk about how we might uh, extend some of those concepts to other states uh, in the Midwest. So the, the native cold water fish in Minnesota lakes are a cool set of fish. Uh, they include burbot, which is really a cold water fish, really a mysterious fish, a fish we don't know a lot about, but it definitely lives in cold, deep, clear lakes. Um, like whitefish, lake trout is the king of uh, cold water fish, really requires high levels of oxygen, way down deep in the, in the cold water. And uh, Cisco as well. And uh, a number of the states in the partnership have uh, have many of these uh, species as well. 
and there's there's a there's definitely some habitat requirements for these fish that limit the uh, the distribution not only in Minnesota but all through all through the upper, upper Midwest. The the fish that we primarily worked on uh, for the latter half of my career was cisco and. It's actually fairly widespread in Minnesota. We have them in 650 lakes, uh, mostly in the north central and northeast part of the state, all the way up to the, uh, the boundary waters on the Canadian border. Um, from a fisheries management point of view, they're very, they're very significant. We see our best growth rates for walleye, northern pike, muskellunge, and lake trout in lakes with robust Cisco populations. So we were very interested in them. It also turns out that they're very sensitive fish to a number of big, large scale ecological stressors that are affecting our lakes right now. Number one is water quality. We knew that, but as we got into it, we also, we also saw that they're very sensitive to uh, climate as well. And we're actually seeing uh, declines in our Cisco populations in Minnesota. We have a pretty rigorous uh, test netting program. We, we hit, a lot of those 650 lakes uh, in the state well, once every five years. And if we look at the overall trends from all of those lakes, we've been seeing a decline since the uh, late 70s, early 80s. So that, that really caught our attention and we put a lot of work into um, why we're seeing that decline. We think both um, water quality and climate is playing a role, especially climate in recent years. So um, cold water fish in Minnesota and all the lakes in the upper Midwest really need good water quality. The reason is because they live below the thermocline, okay? Um, and the amount of oxygen below the thermocline is a direct function of water quality. When that lake stratifies early in the spring, as soon as it gets calm after the, the ice goes out, it stratifies. And the amount of oxygen locked below that thermocline is what's there for the remainder of the summer. And in a lot of lakes, that oxygen runs out by early, mid, late summer, and they're very poor. It's very poor habitat for cold water fish. So it's critical that we have good water quality. And the, the mechanism that that happens is, as you increase the amount of nutrients coming into the lake, and land use plays a key role in the amount of nutrients coming into the lake, you directly stimulate the amount of primary production and, and especially in terms of um, phytoplankton uh, out in the open water zone, those microscopic algal cells that, that develop with a lot of nutrients. When those phytoplankton cells die, they rain into that hypolimnia below the thermocline. And as they, as they decompose, that's what takes away the oxygen below the thermocline. So you really want to minimize the number of nutrients and minimize the amount of phytoplankton in the water column. That's why we see our best cold water fish habitat, our best oxygen concentrations in lakes with uh, low nutrient loading rates and, and excellent water quality. So <clears throat> with that in mind, we, of those 650 lakes, we know that some of them, even after significant climate warming, are still going to provide uh, good cold water fish habitat. We are fortunate to uh, be able to work with Heinz Steffen in his lab at the University of Minnesota. Heinz is a, he's retired now, but he was a world-class uh, lake modeler. And we essentially looked at the characteristics of those lakes, their depth, their water quality, the climate that was near them and developed a model that predicted what the effects on, on uh, of climate were on those lakes. And essentially out of those 650 lakes, we identified 176 approximately lakes that were still deep enough and still clear enough that even in, in, after significant climate warming, we'd still have cold water fish. And one of the one of the key processes that these lakes guard against is 
you know, as the climate warms, not only will the, the average temperature increase, but the shoulder seasons will increase. So the ice is going out earlier. It's, uh, it's forming later. That length of time that that lake is stratified where that oxygen is locked below the thermocline is, is increasing. And that's bad for cold water fish because since that lot, the oxygen has to last the entire summer, if that length of time is, is increasing, you're gonna have, you're gonna have uh, less oxygen concentrations at the end of the summer. So Heinz model that, and we model that duration of stratification in addition to another pretty sophisticated uh, uh, internal lake uh, processes and identify them. And those are, that, that's the map of where the 176 uh, lakes are. And if you notice one thing that should jump out at you, it's that they're primarily in the forested part of the states. The land use in Minnesota, the north central and northeastern part of the state is forested. The uh, central, southern, western parts of the state have been, the land has been converted to uh, pretty intensive farming. That is no oxygen. That, that is no accident. The, the, the reason we have good water quality and good oxygen concentrations below the thermocline is because of those forested watersheds. And that's going to be a key point, really the primary point in this entire presentation. <clears throat> so why is that? Um, when rain falls on forest soils, when the snow melts on forest soils, it soaks into the ground. We have a lot of sandy, gravelly soils, especially in North Central Minnesota, that if they're forested, that water goes into the ground. And that, <clears throat> that groundwater then enters the lake in very high water quality, um, in a very high water quality uh, form. Far better than running off the land, which which then picks up sediments and nutrients and detracts from water quality. So it's absolutely critical that we keep those forested lands forested and, and get those beneficial aspects of, of those forest soils. So that is the key strategy here. So it's both a water quality strategy and a climate adaptation strategy that by protecting those forests, we're gonna protect the water quality and the cold water fish habitat aspects of those lakes. So <clears throat> what are the threats? Um, definitely urbanization. Um, people wanna live in lakes country. And if they can't live on a lake, they wanna live near a lake. And our, our lakes country in Minnesota has some of the highest projected rates of growth uh, anywhere in the state. Um, we're, we're seeing it all over, all over the state especially in North Central Minnesota Lake, especially in the North Central part of the state. And at some point, as that land and that land use changes, you start to directly affect water quality. We actually have some pretty good um, measures of when that happens. The other, the other major risk, and this one kind of crept up on us pretty fast, is that a number of those lands are being converted to agriculture. And we have some pretty significant land use change going on, especially in North Central Minnesota, um, especially where there's groundwater, it seems like. A lot of the irrigated uh, farmers have learned that they can grow crops extremely well, even on very sandy soils. They fertilize enough and they have enough groundwater to, to pump on their crops. And we're seeing a very significant expansion. That, is going to have some real significant effects on water quality in that part of the state. And that's really come on the, on the radar in the last 10 years and, and seems to be intensifying. So those, those are the two big risks to losing those forested lands um, in the northern part of the state. So um, what can we do about it? <clears throat> what are the, the uh, specific tools that we're using uh, to, to protect those forest lands. In Minnesota, we're pretty fortunate. We have, we have some pretty robust forest conservation activities going on right now. And there's a whole suite of tools that are available, but really the, the, uh, the, the bottom line here is the, the conservation 
um, challenge here is on private lands. So that what we're really targeting is, is those private forested lands and the landowners that own them. And, and in Minnesota, that's a big part of our forest land ownership. We have, we have significant federal ownership in two big uh, national forests. We have a lot of state forest lands and county forest lands. But checkerboarded in there are a lot of private lands. And those are the focus of our lake conservation activities in those watersheds. And we have a series of, uh, of tools that are available, including some tax incentives that um, make it valuable for a landowner to keep, keep their land in, in uh, forested uh, conditions. We also have a pretty robust easement program in Minnesota, and that's where we're paying that forest landowner to keep his land forested, not develop it, and not convert it into farming. And those are permanent easements. They're expensive, but they're, they're very effective. And that program has really ramped up in recent years. So we've got the tools. Um, it's a matter of, of where to apply them. <clears throat> so um, probably about 10 years ago, we really started ramping up this program. It's really caught on. It's 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 really resonated within the water quality world, which is really, really kind of satisfying. People get it. Um, these 176 lakes are some of the nicest lakes in Minnesota. So they would, they would be uh, worthy of protecting whether they had cold water fish like Cisco or not. So when people learn that the, 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 the climate adaptation tool for protecting these lakes into the future and keeping them resilient, is, is to maintain their water quality. People are for, all for it, including people who don't even think climate change is a big issue, which is really interesting. So a lot of things came together and it's been a very popular program and a, and a program that's really resonated not only with uh, citizens and landowners, but with a lot of funding um, agencies and organizations as well. In Minnesota, we're very lucky to have a very substantial conservation funding source uh, through a, uh, a percentage of our sales tax. Three eighths of a percent of our sales tax goes to conservation. And that amounts to $190 million a year. That's, that's a monster number. And with that, some of those funds <clears throat> and a growing proportion of those funds are going up into Northern Minnesota. A lot of those funds are going to the Southern part of the state where we're trying to restore impaired systems. It's been very challenging, very challenging. It's really hard to restore something uh, once, once it's gone. It's much easier and much cheaper to protect, uh, especially water quality in lakes before, before it does get impaired. And that this program um, works directly on that aspect. And we're actually making a difference. We're moving a needle. We, we made some calculations within our research unit when I was there that if you could protect 75% of lakes watershed and keep it in forested land use, you're probably gonna have uh, real good water quality. Total phosphorus concentrations, just slightly more than what the natural background conditions are. So that's a wonderful target. It's a target that's really resonated with our funding organizations too. We have a target when we meet them, we go to the next lake and, and start there. And we're, we're moving the needle. The yellow um, part portions of the bar in the uh, upper left-hand corner are, are lakes that we're actually seeing increases in the amount of forest land protected in watersheds of those lakes. And that example there, a 10 mile lake near Hackensack is an example of where we have achieved that 75% goal. And you'll notice that checkerboard nature of land ownership, which is very common in Minnesota. I, I, I'm sure it is in, in Wisconsin and Michigan and other states in the partnership. It's a matter of filling in the checkerboard with enough parcels of protection to, to afford that lake. Um, number one, good water quality now and, and resilience for climate change in the future. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other interesting thing that really has came out of this is how receptive the forest conservation community has been. Uh, in previous years, it was kind of um, distinctly separate um, 
efforts. And you know, the forest conservation people knew that that their their work was protecting water quality. They trumpeted that big time. But it's only been in recent years in Minnesota that we've integrated those efforts directly. And there's been several key players in Minnesota that made, made that happen. Um, Lindbergh Ekela is one who used to work for the Minnesota Forest Resources Council now with, with Board of Water and Soil Resources in Minnesota. And Dan Stewart, also with the Board of Water and Soil Resources people. These guys were visionaries and they directly connected the forest conservation world with the water quality planning world. And to the point where we are now developing what are called landscape stewardship plans. And they are the direct integration of both efforts. So that have, rather than have two separate plans that may or may not talk to each other and, and coordinate, this, this is one plan. And it writes a prescription on how to do forest conservation and water quality conservation in the state and fortunately some of these concepts in our in our Cisco Refuge Lake program and the 75 percent protection are making it into a lot of a lot of these plans and that's what turns on that funding spigot for getting money from these big conservation funding funds into on the ground um, conservation so that's that's been really exciting to work on probably the, the most satisfying aspects uh, of my career. So um, i got just a few more slides. This is where I usually end, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about um, how to extend this uh, to, to states other than Minnesota. But it's interesting, you know, when, when we were doing this pitch a number of years ago in Minnesota, we actually did a back of the envelope um, calculation on how to how to provide sufficient protection for all 176 um, of those cold water refuge lakes, and and to, to bring them all up to 100 to 75 percent level of protection, and, and it came to about 180 million dollars a year, just very back of the envelope calculation, and that would have been an absolute laughable figure. 15 years ago, before we got this big new uh, conservation funding uh, resource. Now, $180 million amateurized over a number of years is very doable. You know, remember we have $190 million available. It's conservation from all kinds of, for all kinds of things, but even just a portion of that to go to this kind of program makes this very possible. And these kind of things are now happening on the ground. So, so, um, how, how would we um, extend this to, to other, parts, other parts of the region? And I know there, there are states like Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, I kind of wish we'd included Indiana because Indiana has, still has some Cisco lakes. They've lost a number, but they still have some. These concepts apply to Indiana. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're attending Indiana, listen up. This stuff applies to you too. So we have, uh, we have some really great scientists working with the partnership, um, Gretchen Hansen, Kevin Worley, Katie Hine, uh, Heidi Rantala, a number, of, a number of great scientists that work on Joe's science and, and, and data committee. We did an analysis here just a couple of years ago of how much cold water fish habitat that we've lost in those three lakes, in, in those three states, all three of those states have Cisco, a, a good number of Cisco lakes, and a lot of similar kind of lakes. A lot of the processes that that are happening on Minnesota lakes are happening in those states, and a lot of the uh, large scale ecological stressors that are happening in Minnesota are happening in those states as well. And we we modeled what that cold water fish habitat looked like back before European settlement, before the, the wide land use change that's happened in the last 150 years. And what we found is the, the red dots on, on there are lakes that have lost the most cold water fish habitat. And in Minnesota, that's definitely in lakes that, that have uh, underground, underground the most land use change. Um, Wisconsin, interestingly, not as bad, but definitely some in the, the central and southern 
part of the state have lost a lot of cold water habitat. And then the southern half of the lower peninsula of Michigan. The northern parts of each of those three, three states still have excellent lakes and good water quality and excellent amounts of cold water fish habitat. We still have a lot of resource to protect in these three states. So the, 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 the methods and the approach that we've developed uh, in Minnesota are directly applicable to these three states. <clears throat> and Joe and a number of people within the partnership are, are pursuing that and, and I commend that. Gretchen is leading some, Gretchen Hansen is leading some refinements of some of these models, so that's a wonderful thing. So my message to the people out there that are, are really interested in this and, and really it, all of these concepts apply not to just lakes with cold water fish like Cisco, they apply to lakes with good water quality in general. If you protect 75% of those forests in the forested parts of these three states, you are gonna do wonderful things for that lake. So there's all kinds of opportunities um, to do some really good work here. And some of the most exciting developments I think are, are happening recently. And with the new uh, presidential administration, there's some real serious talk about some serious climate change kind of conservation work that'll happen on the ground and building climate resi resilience all over the country. And I think we have some uh, essentially a shovel ready program to do that. You know, this is a world-class lake district here. It really is. And it warrants national attention. And I think some of those dollars that are gonna be meant for number one, sequestering carbon <clears throat> through forests. We've got a lot of forests, we can do that. Or even better, reforesting lands that were previously forested that have been converted to agriculture. They may be marginal lands right now, but if those were reforested, that would provide tremendous carbon sequest sequestration opportunities. We combine that with a really high precision map of where which lakes, which lake watersheds we really want, really want to do that. We could do wonderful things for lakes conservation uh, in this part of the country and climate carbon sequestration. So, you know, my pitch, um, my pitch to people that, that are interested in this and that are listening is get a hold of Joel. Joel's a He's a master networker. He, he's a, he understands landscape. He, one of his primary job responsibilities as MGLP coordinator is bring all these people together and have a focused landscape scale, lakes conservation effort uh, for the entire partnership. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity. And I, I think it's pretty exciting. And then, and then finally, uh, I just want to say, just think of, you know, not only the water quality benefits that, that we're, we're doing by, by protecting these forests, think of all the animals that, that rely on these forests. This, this three state and in and, and Indiana, and Indiana as well, forested ecoregion is still functioning at a landscape scale, right? Our prairie ecoregion, at least in Minnesota, has been devastated. It's not functioning on a landscape scale. We're trying to, we're valiantly trying to get connected corridors and, and reserve as much grass and water quality as we can. But in the forested part, part of the state, we have, a, we have a very functional landscape. We do across all three states as well. So there's a lot of benefits that go beyond fish, go beyond water quality. I think the, the opportunity is, is fantastic. So that, that's a pitch for Joel and the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership. Please contact him. I think we can really do something special here. So thank you. Thanks, Pete. That's an inspiring presentation and also a, a, a tall order. Um, you know, I, I very much appreciate it. And I think you're, you're exactly right that we have the opportunity here knowing what we know now and the responsibility really to protect these high quality lakes as we move forward. And 
Um, the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership is an organization that's that's happy to help um, organize mul multiple state efforts um, and and to try to facilitate that interaction and, and that development of, of those plans. At the very least, learning from each other as we all tackle at the state jurisdictional level the same problems um, multiple times. So. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. I have I have a few questions here, but you and I get to talk all the time. And so I'm gonna uh, hold off on my own questions and I'll remind folks at this point, if you have questions for Pete, you can submit them using the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your slides here, or your, of your window here. Uh, press the Q&A button, you can in, enter in a question. We will see it um, pop up and, and we'll get Pete's response on it and, and continue a good conversation because I think Pete is very much excited about talking about how this could work or um, the trials and tribulations that they've had in Minnesota and how they might apply them in other states or at a regional level. So, um, so the first question I have then um, is, um, so you've identified forest protection and re reforestation as high priority actions for lake conservation are there lake conservation actions that are commonly funded or done in the Midwest that are less valuable? If we're gonna be moving toward this reforestation and, and forest protection and approach, is there something that we should be de-emphasizing? Well, I, I think one of the key questions, one of the fundamental conservation questions is how much effort and money you put on protecting lakes that are currently in good shape versus restoring lakes that are, that are in tough shape. And in, in Minnesota, it, traditionally, probably 90% of that money orig originally went to trying to restore those impaired systems. And we're finding that is so difficult and we're barely moving the needle on a lot of those systems that we're starting to see funding, funding decision makers move some of that money to the Northern part of the state. And I don't know what the, the figure is now it might be more like 30, 70, 40, 60, somewhere in there um, in terms of amount of money that's going up to protect lakes versus the amount of money that's going to restore lakes. So that's that's a key question. Now, now that you know the interesting thing about the, the partnership is we have lakes of both types and both warrant attention. They just do. The question is what what that um, percentage should be. And and interestingly. When, when we were doing a lot of our planning within DNR about 10 years ago, we developed a DNR fish habitat plan. We asked our fisheries managers what they thought that ratio should be of, of how much money we put into protecting lakes that are in good shape versus restoring. We told them put their uh, statewide hats on rather than the local area. And we had a little eye clicker exercise and it came out to 60, 40, 60% 60 of our efforts should go to lake, protecting lakes in good shape. 40 uh, restoring lakes that are that are impaired. Interestingly, University of Minnesota and their each their human dimensions unit did a did a survey of, and I can't remember if it was our anglers or our citizens, but they essentially asked them a similar question. How much do you think should go into protecting lakes that are in good shape versus restoring lakes that are that are that, that need restoration? And it came out to like 5941, essentially the same 60-40 ratio that our managers did. So I, I think that's a fundamental question all over the part, all over the partnership and, and what that balance is. And I, I think it's worth worth discussing and thinking about. It's a good answer and a lot, a lot to think about. You know, we we've always had such a heavy focus on restoration and I can say that same in Michigan. Um, that's where the funding historically has come. So it's, it's good to be thinking about shifting at least some of that toward what scientists, managers, and, and the public, as you say, seem to support. Another question, uh, what approaches seem to be the most effective in convincing people that forest conservation in the watershed, and not just around the lake shore, is going to help lake water, water quality? Huge question. And when people see how large a lake's watershed is, it's, it's an eye-opener. Not only the public, but even a lot of our professionals. For many years, we were we were 
primarily concerned about the area around a lake that you can see and its immediate watershed and what the land use changes and the cabin development and septic systems and all that. But when you model phosphorus, you find out very quickly that there's sources well beyond the shoreline and you have to take into account all of them. And some of those lake watersheds can be like quite large and actually dwarf the amount of phosphorus coming in right near the shoreline. So it's absolutely critical if you're going to do this kind of work, it's got to be done at a watershed scale and not just a shoreland scale. And that makes it infinitely more difficult. Far more number of acres, landowners, agencies, the water quality world is much more complicated than just the lakeshore conservation world. It's a huge leap, but you got to do it. But fortunately, you know, once you once you take the leap, it, it is doable because there's still fairly large intact forests and forest landowners in the watersheds of these lakes, at least in Minnesota, and I, I suspect in, in the other states in the partnership, it is doable. And if you have the tools and the funding, you can do this on a watershed scale. You can do this on a landscape scale. So I'm, I'm actually quite, quite hopeful and optimistic that even though these are big challenges and the, and the, the problem is bigger than just Lakeshore, it, it, it is doable. Thanks. Yeah. And I was talking with John Hebert, who, you know, a colleague of yours, and he mentioned recently uh, in explaining watersheds um, versus shorelines that uh, if you think about the lake shoreline and you walk along the lake shoreline, when you hit that, that river that feeds into the lake, you really shouldn't skip past it. You should continue along the shoreline up the, up the stream, up into the tributaries to where the source of that water is. And if you think of the lake's shoreline, then the shoreline of that, that water system as including that entire network, then that gives kind of a layperson a better sense for what the kind of true shoreline for the, the influences for the lake are. And I know that um, glosses over um, groundwater and other, other influences, but for a layperson, I thought that was a compelling image. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, Heidi. Rantala asks, uh, one, of the, one of the things you taught her is that, that really made an impact on her is that harvesting private forests can fit into a framework of lake related conservation. So can you talk a little bit about how working forests can work into conservation for lakes? Yeah, I, they can. Um, you know, fortunately in our, in our states we're flat and forest harvests, um, Generally, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but generally forest harvest doesn't have a real big long-term water quality effect. There are some right after a, a, a big clear cut for a few years before the, the regrowth comes back. But, and as long as, as long as you have some reasonable BMPs where you're staying away from, from uh, riparian areas, you can have forest harvest um, and have that fit in quite nicely. Um, it's, it's far different than out, out west in Idaho or wherever you have a clear cut going straight down into a trout or a salmon spawning stream that has devastating consequences here, not as much. So we, we think with some well-managed forest harvest done with proper BMPs and done with conservation in mind, those private lands can remain working lands for us where timber harvest is still allowable. And, and frankly, um, um, encourage because having a real vibrant forest products economy is absolutely key to keeping those lands for us. Otherwise, the economic incentive is to convert them to other uses like agriculture or development. So having a real vibrant forest products economy, I think is part of this. And I think that's one of the reasons of, you know, the forestry world has been receptive to our ideas is because you know, th that can play a role in this and, and for both conservation efforts. Was there initial hesitation from the forest product industry? There is, and there still is, and there's, there's some distrust there. And part of it is, you know, at, as water quality and fisheries people, we just have an inherent suspicion of what logging does to water quality. And, and you have to convince yourself of when that is the case and when it is not. And again, on steep slopes, 
right next to a stream or a lake or river, there's probably some issues. Um, but if it's done well, and it's done with 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 uh, BMPs and conservation in mind, it we can have forest harvest. And in the end, a lot of people you'll, you'll finally come to the realization that it's probably beneficial to have some because it provides that incentive to keep keep forest lands forested. <clears throat> And, and you know, the key thing is that that's the key to getting a private landowner because um, a lot of those landowners need a little bit of income coming in from that timber harvest to allow them to keep that land. Otherwise, they, they may sell it. They may sell it to a developer or somebody who wants to farm it. As long as that landowner has a little bit of income, he's more likely to keep it. And that forest conservation easement, which is then permanent, allows that to uh, excuse me, happen into perpetuity. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, shifting gears a little bit. Next question is, how do you convince decision makers to broaden protection efforts to all high quality lakes, not just the ones that maybe have trout or other charismatic species? So including maybe shallow lakes with high water quality or other types? Excellent question. And, you know, there's actual actually a federal mandate to do that. You know, a, a little known, but sig I think significant part of the Federal Clean Water Act of 1972 is the states are required to keep lakes that are in good shape in good shape. It's called the anti-degradation clause. The states are not allowed to let lakes and streams degrade to the point of being impaired. Um, it's not a well-used portion of it. I, I, I'd love to see it more. It's starting to get more used in, in Minnesota. I suspect the other states, but Essentially, you need to, to designate those lakes and systems that are in good shape and develop, I think, formal plans to protect them. And this, that kind of formal plan can fit in exactly with, with what we're doing. So there, there's essentially a federal mandate to do that. And I think, you know, the, the fish habitat conservation world, the lake water quality world, the people that are really interested in in maintaining good water quality in the forest and part of the state can use that and remind our, each of our states that's a requirement. And not only you know, is it a federal requirement, it's just something we should be doing because it's, it's just the right thing to do uh, through all, all of our states. Makes sense, yeah. Okay, um, you mentioned, you know, 75% as this threshold for forested watersheds. And, um, and that, that's been a consistent, simple, relatively simple message. And I think there's a lot of appeal to the relatively simple message. Um, have you, from the research perspective, looked at um, other metrics and whether there are um, different ways to essentially package that or be more efficient within a watershed? And so, um, you know, we know that, that the buffers of streams, for example, are more critical potentially than um, an area that's far away from a stream. And you've mentioned that, um, you know, when you're talking about strategies within a lake's watershed. So I'm curious, have, have you done any research or looked at um, thresholds for protecting buffers or anything um, on a more granular level, or is that best left to um, the implementation by the watershed um, stakeholders? No, I, I think it's the next frontier. So that 75% value is a very crude, a very rough recommendation. And it essentially came from, from some research that Tim Cross and I, Tim Cross is also retired as well. And we looked at total phosphorus concentrations across the entire state of Minnesota, from the Boundary Waters to the intensively farmed Southwest part of the state. It's a huge gradient. It's it's got to be one of the sharpest gradients of anywhere in the world. So it actually a very nice place to study that. And that was the place, the 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 seventy five percent permanent vegetation value, which the, you know the the sister statistic is twenty five percent of that watershed is disturbed in either um, some form of agriculture, urban um, land use. That, that's just the general point where that line started to deviate away from natural baseline total phosphorus concentration level. 
That's all it is. So it's a very rough and crude number. It's a mean value. It's not lake specific, but it's, it, it's and we know that some lakes, it's, it, it's gonna be a different value for all lakes. On average, it's gonna come down to 75% if you're close, but it's gonna be different for all the lakes. And Gretchen's doing some, some more lake specific recommendations so that'll be interesting, interesting. But I think the next frontier is to take individual lakes and do some very high resolution nutrient and settling, settle, uh, sediment modeling. You know, the LIDAR tools that are available, some of the high resolution watershed modeling tools that if they were applied specifically for lakes watershed, you are gonna identify those critical areas with steep slopes, erodible soils, so, uh, lands that are, that are uh, um, very high risk for conversion to other, other land uses. You're gonna have a much higher resolution conservation picture of what might, needs to be done on a watershed if you have one of those high resolution watershed models, lake specific. And I, I see that as the next frontier. And I hope there's scientists out there to, to start working on that. I, the, the technology is developing so fast, the GIS and spatial analytical tools, stream power indices, LIDAR, it's the soil, the soil, the soils information with the high resolution the soil survey information, um, risk analyses of which lands are at most risk to being converted to agriculture or development. You combine all those in a high resolution uh, model and you can really develop some super conservation prioritization maps for lakes. So I, I think the next 10, 20 years are gonna be pretty exciting um, from, that, from that perspective. Yeah, and that gets me thinking, of course, uh, for those that aren't aware, the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership has a science and data team that has been working on some of the, these issues and, and some of the research that Pete referenced, reference that was created using um, a database that we'd put together when the MGLP was created back in 2009. And we're currently embarking on updating that database. Um, and so it sounds like a ripe area for investigation within the MGLP and um, uh, something that we might look into further. If I can convince you out of retirement, Pete. Um, we've got a question from John Hebert here. Um, he's, uh, he's mentioned uh, the starting to work in uh, some of the areas in southern Minnesota uh, with disturbed areas and looking for lakes that are in the top of the watershed and maybe have small watersheds um, where you might be able to do a little bit more um, protection or restoration even if they're disturbed. So you want to talk about that, expound on that a little bit more? Right on, you know, and, and some of the tops of those watersheds are high up on the moraine and the farmland isn't quite as valuable. The real hilly tend to be rocky. The farmland might not be quite as valuable. Um, those are excellent places to start. And in southern in southwestern Minnesota, a lot of those lakes and lands are on the what's called the Prairie Coteau, which actually extends well into South Dakota and, and up into North Dakota as well. And that that kind of general trend of the, the land being a little more marginal for farmland and being at the top of the watershed and that high moraine, those, those are excellent places to, to start some restoration work um, where you are trying to bring back some quality. It seems like you got something to work with. And, and a lot of those lands are, are maybe pastured instead of uh, intensive row crops, which is a, a good thing for water quality. As long as you have some perennial vegetation, some grass on the land, I think you have something to work with. And you know, the prairie conservation people are keen on getting grass back on the landscape. I, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity down there to kind of join forces. You know, let's pick some lake watersheds that we think would be good candidates for this and team up with the prairie conservation people and get some grass on the landscape because the grass on the landscape will do the same thing as forests do up in the forested watershed. It's vegetation that you need, permanent perennial vegetation. The grass will do that too. So I, I think with some real strategic thinking, I think that's where you do spend, you know, that those restoration dollars is on really small headwater kind of lakes where you truly do have a chance 
of moving the needle. So ex excellent question. All right. Um, and I'll mention, you mentioned some of Gretchen Hansen's research. Of course, Gretchen is with the University of Minnesota and recently gave a presentation at a University of Minnesota webinar on research that had come from the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnerships efforts. And that is linked on our um, webinars page as well. So if folks want to check out her excellent talk on that research, um, there's a link for that, that archived research as well. Pete, you, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned, um, you know, there's a bunch of things that eat Cisco um, and, and that Cisco are this indicator species. Can you talk a little bit about how people react to conservation efforts for Cisco and, and how your message, especially now working with the conservation district, um, you know, how you deliver that message, how it's received, um, and, and are you talking about a single species? Are you talking about multiple species? Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing how it resonated way more than I ever thought. I mean, number one, our anglers get it. Um, they, the avid ones know the relationship between Cisco and, and big predators, and they, they fully support it. The lakeshore owners get it. And I think mainly because the, you know, when they understand that Cisco live in really nice lakes, and the the uh, the fix is to protect the water quality in those lakes, whether they get it or not, they like the solution. the The funding organizations get it, and it's interesting, even at a county level. I know back when I was working for the DNR, I gave a presentation to a number of the, the local soil and water conservation districts of which when I'm doing a little part-time work now, but they, they told me that it, when they go to their county boards and their, their local boards, that if they can tie that water quality work back to fish, that's, that works. In, in Minnesota, fishing is a big thing. And those, especially the Northern Minnesota counties understand the value, the economic value of fishing in those states. And if they go and tell them that the conservation water quality work that they're doing is gonna help protect the good fishing in that county, the county boards start supporting it. So it, it's been amazing uh, how it just seems to have resonated and uh, it's been pretty cool. Okay, thanks, Pete. Um, all right. This is the last chance for questions from Pete. Uh, if, you, if you want to add any questions in the Q&A box, uh, please do so now. Um, Pete, we had, we had a pretty good number of folks joining today. And so I think it's always difficult to thank you because we can't uh, clap and give you the ovation that we should. But I imagine that if we could, uh, we would hear a standing, right. standing ovation for you. And I want to say on behalf of the folks listening, thank you. Um, for your presentation and, and for your research on this issue. Um, and again, this presentation will be shared with all the folks that registered for the presentation and, and it'll be on our um, MGLP website if folks want to share it and um, share, share it with folks that might be interested. So um, with that, I see no other questions. Any parting thoughts before we all take off, Pete? Yeah, no, great. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, everyone. That's, yeah, for all these years, I'm still excited about this kind of work. So thank you. Well, I hope we're all as lucky uh, to <laughs> be able to say that as, as we retire. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We're, we're going to wrap this up. Uh, everybody have a good day. And, uh, and we will talk to uh, you all at our next MGLP webinar. Be sure to check out the webinar page um, for more presentations in the future.